Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the next lecture in this series, Journeys in Human Genetics and Genomics, this colloquium organized by American Society of Human Genetics and NHGRI. Um, today, the topic is about sequencing genomes. And just to contextualize it relative to the earlier lectures, I spoke earlier in this series to describe how the Human Genome Project generated a first sequence of the human genome. And then more recently, you heard Kim Doheny talk about all the new methods that have been developed for sequencing DNA, these revolutionary new methods that have come about since the end of the Human Genome Project. And this really now sets up today's talk um, to really describe the nitty gritty of how we actually do assemble genome sequences. And I'm delighted uh, that Adam Filippi is uh, gonna give this lecture. I have um, incredible admiration for, for Adam. I regard him as the new generation of genomics pioneers. I had the honor and pleasure of working shoulder to shoulder with genomics pioneers who got us through the Human Genome Project, got that first sequence of the human genome, but that needed to be picked up by a new generation of genomicists and, uh, and finished once and for all completely but also developing new paradigms on how we do this. And um, Adam truly has become such a new generation of such a genomics pioneer. He's in our intramural program here at the National Human Genome Research Institute, and he's quickly become a world expert in this area. And he's gonna tell you more biographical details about himself. Um, so I'm just gonna turn it over to Adam. Adam, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Very gracious introduction. That means a tremendous amount coming from you. Um, very happy to be here. You hit it on the head, nitty gritty. That's what I like. And that's what we're going to get into, how we turn these sequencing technologies actually into genomes that we can use both for research uh, and in the clinic. So without further ado, we will jump right into it. Eric asked me to start off with a brief introduction of my career trajectory and how I ended up where I am now doing genomics full time at NHGRI. And so this is from coder to decoder. And by coder, I mean my first love and my first passion, <laughs> which was video games. And I'm talking all the way back to elementary school. This is kind of my earliest memory of interacting with computers. And it was all driven by this desire to play video games, which as a kid growing up in the 80s, you could only do if you went to the arcade. And if you were at home, you were stuck. But we happened to have this very early computer called a VIC-20, which is shown up in the top right. This is pre-internet. They didn't even have floppy disks at the time, used cassette tapes. And if you wanted to do video gaming at home, you would order these magazines that would literally show up in the mail. And inside of them, they would contain code for the video game that you wanted to play, that you would have to transcribe letter for letter out of this magazine onto your VIC-20. And if you didn't even have the tape drive for the VIC-20, it's all in RAM. And so when the power goes out, you would just lose everything and have to start from scratch. Well. This cover is one that I actually remember, Oil Tycoon, <laughs> probably in maybe third grade or something, sitting in my parents' living room on the TV with this VIC-20 in my lap. And you can see a screenshot of the game here, super rudimentary. You just have this like oil derrick and you drill down and you either find oil or you hit rocks and you can move left and right and you can put your drilling pipe down <laughs> and that's the extent of the game. And you flip to the back of this magazine and it's literally basic VIC-20 code. I think this game was maybe four or five pages. And imagine me as like a third grader sitting there transcribing this in letter for letter just because I want to play such a basic game. Well, because I had that love for coding, I decided to go to school for computer science. Um, again, just thinking primarily, hey, I like coding. I'm good at it. Um, and I got extremely fortunate to bump into two wonderful mentors. Uh, this was at Loyola University, Maryland. On the left is Roberta Sabin, who was my freshman year computer science teacher and the department chair at the time. And then a little bit later, Art Delcher, um, who was also a department chair at the time and ended up being a research mentor for me. And like I said, I went for computer science not knowing that I was going to make it a career and not ever having heard the word research or knew that it was a career uh, before going to school. But both uh, Robbie and Art were very active in research. Robbie did 
cryptography and numerics and mathematics and art was involved with the Human Genome Project, among other things. And interacting with those two people over the course of my undergrad just really changed my career trajectory from one that was just pure coding to one that's now become pure science. And I really have to credit uh, Art Delcher, who towards my senior year just made an offhand comment, hey, you should think about graduate school in the future. And that thought had literally never entered my mind before Art said it. And it did put me on a track of research for the rest of my career. And it's funny how those little words of support from a good mentor can change a person. And so I have a huge debt of gratitude to both Art and Robbie for launching me on this track that you're gonna hear about today. But I'm gonna start with the basics. Just like Art started me off, I walked into his office volunteering to help him with a research project. He was working on gene finding and genome comparison at the time. And as a young computer science student, I knew nothing about the biology. And he just sat me down and said, all right, you've got four letters, A, C, G, and T. They come in pairs, A pairs with T, C pairs with G. That's pretty much all you need to know. <laughs> Off you go. Here's a text file of ACGs and Ts, and I want you to manipulate it in this way that he drew up on a whiteboard. I've come to learn a lot more <laughs> after my career about how the genome works, including 23 chromosomes in a human, 46 if you count the diploid pairs of them, half of those complement from your mom, half of them from your dad. And if you split open that double helix, you see your ACGs and Ts. It turns out this code, and I mean that in a very literal sense, you know, this is the code, it's the program of your body, it's the program of your cells that your cells are executing to make you who you are. And so I really think of it from that perspective as a code running these instructions and turning you into a human. And at its very fundamental level, as Eric described to you and others, is very easy to read for a computer scientist because it literally state-of-the-art <laughs> genomics is still a text file with ACGs and Ts describing the genome. And so for a human genome, we're talking about 6 billion characters in a diploid human genome, including all 46 chromosomes. You can compress that down and talk about it in binary code and compose it as two bits per base pair. So for instance, 00, zero could represent A, zero, 01 could be your T and so forth. And so in that compressed form, a human genome stored on your laptop only takes up about 1.5 gigabytes of data for a human. And here's a, an actual piece of human chromosome one. And it's just an ASCII text file, ACGs and Ts. And the size uh, is not all that big either. If you compare it to the size of this program, PowerPoint that I'm running right now, that's taking up 1.8 gigabytes on my disk. And I like to give that as an example because it shows just the extreme efficiency of the genetic code at being able to store the information necessary to make a human in the same amount of space it takes us to store Microsoft PowerPoint, which has a few more flaws, I think, than a human being. Um, and people have literally printed it out. If you've been to uh, NHGRI, Eric's uh, headquarters on Bethesda campus. He's got a bit of chromosome painted along the whole wall. Uh, the people at the Wellcome Trust have printed out the human genome in binders, and here it is. It takes up a whole number of shelves to contain it all. But it's very easy for somebody like me, having very little knowledge to get started because I just pick up text files, read them in, and then operate on those strings. And I was also very fortuitous with my timing because I was coming up as an undergraduate around 2000, and I had a front row seat to the Human Genome Project that I'm sure Eric gave you a great retelling of earlier, and his front row seat as well. I was a little bit younger than him coming up as an undergraduate, but the excitement in the air was palpable. And my advisor, Art, who I talked about earlier, uh, actually worked at Celera Genomics part-time uh, on the genome assembly team, which was the private effort uh, to finish the human genome led by Craig Venter there, shown on the left. And just as a young person, you know, very easily influenced, uh, this really changed my way of thinking. And it really opened my eyes to what was possible as a computer scientist and the impact that we could make because I was looking at art, I was looking at people like Gene Myers, computer scientists that were actively contributing to this and in fact were essential to the reconstruction of the human genome. And so I accepted an internship uh, at the Institute for Genomic Research in Rockville, Maryland, which was also founded by Craig Venter, but then later 
uh, run by Claire Frazier for many years. And again, was very lucky to run into Jane Carlton, Stephen Salzberg, Mihai Pop, which were great mentors there and really taught me everything I needed to know about genomics. And I worked at genomics uh, up until 2005. Um, in parallel to the human project, Tiger's focus was primarily microbial. So bacterial genomes, parasites. Uh, Jane Carlton, for instance, was interested in malarial parasites. Um, and we did all manner of sequencing and comparison of those early genomes on the microbial side. But then a tragic event happened in 2001 that would really reshape my career for more than a decade. And that was what's now called Amerithrax. And so this is just a few weeks after the September 11th attacks in New York on the World Trade Center, there was mysterious envelopes laced with anthrax spores mailed around the United States. And you can imagine at the time, the United States is reeling from September 11th, everybody's on edge. And now all of a sudden there's anthrax being sent around in the mail. You know, is this terror? What's going on? It was huge news and it was hugely important at the time. And most important, people died. And so the first one to die was a photo editor at American Media in Florida. Uh, he was diagnosed with anthrax shortly thereafter. And by the end of October, there had been letters found at NBC News, New York Post, the U.S. Senate offices, resulting in a total of four deaths and a tremendous amount of fear in the country. Shown on the top right is one of those letters being handled in a biocontainment box. Um, and then there was anthrax spores poured inside of those letters so that when you opened them, they would aerosolize, you would breathe them in and contract uh, anthrax. Um, the bottom right is showing one of the Senate offices undergoing a deep cleaning. Uh, I actually was in that exact Senate office just a few years ago, so I'm glad they did a good job cleaning it up because I'm still doing fine. But by the stats, uh, there was five mailings, at least, that were known, uh, 22 victims resulting in five deaths, and a huge response by the FBI primarily that kicked off a seven-year investigation to try to trace the origin of these mailings, resulting in 600,000 FBI hours. Uh, the FBI has a really good history of this. The, the hyperlink there is on the bottom giving you the summary of everything that went into this tremendous effort. So how does this tie back into me as a genomicist? Well, when they cultured those anthrax spores on medium and grew up the Bacillus anthracis colonies, they noticed something curious, that there was distinct phenotypes, or in this case, we called them morphotypes, where each of those colonies had a distinct look and feel to them, where the wild type there is on the top right, and then four different varieties you can see on the bottom. And so from the genomic perspective, the idea was we're going to sequence the complete genomes of each of these individual isolates, and then we're going to compare the genomes of those Bacillus anthracis spores to all of the known Bacillus anthracis uh, that's around the United States at research and biodefense institutes. Um, as quoted in the FBI report, the test needed to conduct such an analysis in 2001 uh, was Star Wars stuff. It just didn't exist. And places like Tiger were one of the only places in the world that could pull this off. And we succeeded in sequencing each of these individual morphotypes and various strains. This was work led uh, by my friend Dave Rasco, Tim Reed, who's now at Emory, Claire Frazier, uh, Jacques Ravel, and many others. And the link for those different morphotypes and those phenotypes goes back to, in some cases, single nucleotide variants in the genome of anthrax, which is 5 million bases long. And so, for instance, morphotype B there, there's only a single nucleotide variant intergenic upstream of a sporulation factor. Some of them are duplications in other genes around the genome. And those very minor changes led to these morphotypes and basically made the genomic fingerprint that allowed the FBI to figure out where these mailings could be coming from. This kind of launched uh, a field that's now referred to as microbial forensics. And you'll be very familiar with it if you traced the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 over the past years and saw big phylogenetic trees of the different isolates emerging and being able to track a genome in real time evolving like that is only possible with genomic technologies that have been developed over the decades. And this Amerithrax case was, I think, the first one that attempted to do this for a microbial genome. They knew that the original anthrax that was in the research labs around the U.S. was originally isolated from a dead cow. 
it's called the Ames isolate because I think it went to the Ames, Iowa facility, where it was then cultured up and grown at Fort Detrick and distributed to other facilities around the U.S. for further study, including being sent eventually to the U.K., important down, um, and traced around. All of these genomes got sequenced, and by looking at those genomic fingerprints, the FBI was able to prove a link, not 100%, but a very likely link between the isolates of anthrax that were taken out of the deceased to the original source material at Fort Detrick, and then later linked it to an individual that worked at Fort Detrick, who unfortunately later took his own life under the weight of the investigation. Because of the success of that investigation um, and the fear that it stoked, the US government decided that it was a good idea to build a facility that could do this for the FBI so that they wouldn't have to outsource it in the future to nonprofits like Tiger. And that led to the construction of the National Biodefense Analysis and Countermeasures Center, where I went to work from 2010 to 2015 before I joined NHGRI. And we specialized in basically making this routine, taking genomes from microbial sources, completing the genome and being able to construct very highly precise evolutionary trees to determine uh, the source of various outbreaks or the potential pathogenicity of unknown materials. And NBAC carries on to this day. I'm no longer there, but you can imagine they played a big role in the COVID response. In particular, they were able to run as one of the largest BSL-4 facilities in the US um, assays to test the survivability of the virus on common surfaces. And so if you saw in the news reports about you know, SARS dies after being exposed to air after X number of hours, those types of results were coming from places like NBAC that were able to do those experiments in a safe and secure manner. But as a bioinformatician, my job was basically done. We had figured out how to sequence and complete and assemble microbial genomes of the type Bacillus anthracis, which is about 5 million bases. And I'm really an engineer at heart. I like solving problems. So we went on looking for bigger genomes and bigger problems. And that led me to NHGRI and the human genome, which is more than a thousand times bigger than Bacillus anthracis and posed a much more difficult genome assembly and bioinformatics problem. And so that was all in the 2010s now when I made the move to NHGRI. How was the Human Genome Project in the days uh, that Eric presented able to construct the human genome around the same time that we were struggling to just assemble genomes that were less uh, than a thousand times as big? And so I'm gonna walk you through an abbreviated summary of the nitty gritty of how the first human genome was not just sequenced, but assembled into the reference genome. And so, of course, to the very basics, you have to start with cells. The Human Genome Project started with a variety of samples taken from public volunteers. You take those cells, you break them open, you pull out the chromosomes, you extract the DNA using various biochemical techniques. And then the key is we haven't yet, although we might in the future, developed a way to sequence a whole chromosome in one piece. We have these sequencing machines that you've probably learned about. They can only sequence a few thousand bases, upwards of a million bases at a time. These human chromosomes can be hundreds of millions of bases, and we can't do it in one go. And so we prepare that high molecular weight DNA for sequencing by doing something counterintuitive, which is shredding it all to little bits. That beautiful <laughs> globby high molecular weight DNA fragmented into tiny little pieces of maybe a few thousand bases long at the time of the Human Genome Project. And it's those individual fragments then that we perform DNA sequencing on. So we do that by what's known as DNA sequencing or genome sequencing. And the input material to that process are those sheared and isolated DNA fragments of a few thousand bases. At the time of the genome project, they went into an instrument called an ABI 3700, which was a DNA sequencing instrument uh, that did a lot of the work in the later parts of the human genome project. They are giant, kind of mini fridge sized devices. Here's a picture from the Sanger Institute, probably in the late nineties showing these instruments doing their jobs. And there was rooms and rooms of these around the world performing the work of the Human Genome Project in order to generate enough data to do assembly. And the purpose of those machines is to take these DNA molecules and to digitize them into those ones and zeros we were talking about earlier. So physical molecules now being digitized into ACGs and Ts 
by the process of DNA sequencing. That puts it on a computer where people like me can finally deal with it. One important note is that it's not good enough to just sequence a genome once. You have to sequence it many times. And that's because those reads are getting randomly sampled from the genome in what you could think of as a Poisson mathematical process. And as a consequence, because those reads are randomly sampled across the genome, if you want to make sure you cover every base by at least one read, you have to sequence extra reads to just make sure the probabilities work out that you fill all the holes. It has an added benefit that because each of those reads is basically an independent experiment, reading each base multiple times improves your overall accuracy and your confidence in those individual bases. And this oversampling technique is called coverage for short or depth of coverage. And it's simply at every position in the genome, as you can see here, you extend down and count how many reads actually read that particular base in the genome, and that's the depth at that location. And at the time of the Human Genome Project, a typical depth for a project like this was around eight-fold coverage. So for every base, it was read about eight times. We do much higher coverages these days because it's so much cheaper and better to do a higher coverage, both to fill in all of those gaps and to get good accuracies. Uh, now, about 30 or 60-fold coverage is more common. So in the end, when you have all of those fragments and you need to reconstruct the genome, you're actually getting input from multiple copies of the genome. So if we do an analogy here and we shred Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities and we start off with five copies and we fragment those spools of tape into individual fragments that are each five words long, the genome assembly problem is to take all of those tiny fragments and to put the puzzle back together again. But all of those fragments come mixed. You don't know where they came from the genome. Unfortunately, in Dickens and in genomes, some of those individual reads are identical, but they come from different locations in the text. And so by just seeing the words, you don't know if it was from the first or the second half of that sentence, which makes reconstruction difficult. And a practical consideration, the sequencing technologies aren't perfect, and so the reads come off of the machine with errors. Uh, we're going to just assume perf perfect reads today, um, but imagine all of this multiplied <laughs> much more difficult uh, if the reads are not exactly accurate themselves. So how would you put this puzzle back together again? Uh, I think the kind of obvious and naive approach is to just pick up fragments from the floor. And like you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, you eye them up and say, OK, I found two pieces. They both have an overlap of these two words, best of. So I'm going to stick those together. And you kind of greedily continue pasting words together based on those overlaps. But the problem occurs due to these repeats, these duplicated fragments that are identical but are coming from different places in the genome or the text. Because here, now because of times it was the is a repeat, I have two choices. I could either paste was the worst of times or was the age of wisdom next. And I have no way of knowing which of those two belongs with the sentence that I've constructed so far. And so if you just greedily and haphazardly start gluing these fragments together, the repeats can lead you astray and you end up with what we call a misassembly or a, a improper reconstruction of the genome. Um, and this was a big problem in the late 90s and the early 2000s and some of the early genome assemblers would suffer from these kind of mistakes. So a more principled mathematical approach, thanks to many uh, that contributed, but two that really stick out in my mind are Gene Myler's and Pavel Pevsner's, the godfathers of genome assembly to me, uh, developed ideas called a genome assembly graph. And this is a mathematical construction. In this case, I'm going to present it as what's called a de Brown graph, where you build nodes and edges in this graph such that you take all of those fragments and you fragment them a little bit more. You just chop off the last word and make them one word fewer. And then you put edges between those two adjacent subfragments. So it was the best of becomes two nodes. It was the best and was the best of with an edge between them. And because you've sampled the genome at multiple fold coverage, you probably have little fragments many times over all the different words of the text here. And a magical thing happens when you do this very simple construction across all of your fragments. The benefit, as you will see, is that this keeps track of all of the possible reconstructions of the text um, without greedily making mistakes in the repeats. And so if we just follow that simple construction rule, you can see you get these kind of linear paths. 
in the unique regions of the text. It was the best of times, it was the, and then we hit this repeat. Whereas before we know we can take two different paths. We can either go to worst or age next. The beauty of the graph is that you don't make a decision up front. You just remember that there was ambiguity here and you continue constructing the graph in this way, building the nodes and the edges. And the repeats end up as these nodes that we call branching nodes, where you have two possible outputs, two possible inputs, and sometimes many more than two edges coming in and out of these repeat nodes. But at least you know, I haven't made any mistakes. The unique bits are properly constructed. So you can take those linear paths where there are no branching nodes and collapse them. And this is how we get something that we typically call contigs or a contiguous piece of sequence that we know with pretty good confidence is correctly reconstructed because we didn't pass through those repeats. And so all of the nodes here, we could output from the assembler as confidently reconstructed bits of the genome with gaps left in between. So these style of approaches, not exactly that approach, but this style of approach was used by both the public and the private genome projects to decode the Book of Life. The Human Genome Project simplified the problem a little bit upfront by taking what's called a back-by-back -back approach. And you can imagine this as they kind of pre-extracted individual pages from the book and then worked on assembling the genome a page at a time. And when the genome assembler only has to deal with a page at a time, there's fewer repeats contained in one page than there are contained across the whole genome. And so the assembly problem is simplified. The downside is it's hugely labor intensive to pull all of those pages out um, and, and build them one at a time on the laboratory, on the wet side. The Solera strategy, because they had investors and had a real time crunch to get it done as quickly as possible, took an ambitious approach, but probably uh, a bit ahead of its time, to fragment the whole genome at once and try to computationally reconstruct the genome in one go. This is really an example of kind of the tortoise and the hare approach. Um, the back by back approach is way more costly, takes way more labor, but it's what actually got the job done at the end of the day. And it ended up being the lasting reference for the human genome for 20 years um, because that care was taken. The Solera approach, on the other hand, because they were forced to innovate and be very quick in their process, developed this whole genome shotgun approach almost a bit ahead of their time. It turns out just a few years after the completion of the genome project, basically every genome done since has been done with this whole genome shotgun strategy because it's quicker and cheaper. And now we have the technology, both on the sequencing and the computational side to do it correctly. And so really nobody does back by back anymore, but it lives on in the legacy of the reference genome that we've used for 20 years. So what did we end up with uh, in 2004 when the human genome uh, public project was drawn to a close? This marker paper was published called Finishing the Euchromatic Sequence of the Human Genome, put out by the International Human Genome Sequencing Consortium. And there's a couple of keywords that I just want to highlight here that'll become important later. In the title, the keyword euchromatic, which we'll talk about in a second, that's not the whole genome, that's a fraction of the genome. Uh, 202.85 billion nucleotides included, 341 gaps, those are the regions between the contigs where it was unclear uh, how to do that reconstruction for a variety of reasons. Um, but they covered 99% of that euchromatic fraction of the genome at an error rate of about one per 100,000 bases. So what does euchromatic mean and what was missing if we read uh, between the lines here? And this figure was included in that paper and highlighted in red are the regions that were gaps in that genome assembly. So you have each of uh, the 24 uh, different human chromosomes here with the gaps highlighted in red and the sequenced and completed regions cover about 90% of the genome, with those gaps representing about 10% of the genome. And that's the so-called heterochromatin. It's densely packed, generally gene-poor uh, regions uh, of the genome known as heterochromatin. So this was the state of the genome in 2004, and really the state of the genome for the past 20 years. Uh, all of the analyses that have taken place against the human reference have been against a version, an incremental version of this assembly that was released first in 2004. So I'm going to pause there uh, for the first Q&A session, um, and I'm happy to entertain questions uh, about my career path, uh, what I currently do in genomics, um, or any kind of technical questions on how the initial Human Genome Project uh, worked 
and uh, its legacy for the past 20 years. And I guess Eric is moderating this. How does the Q and A work? I certainly can. Questions? I guess I should, I should also look in the chat. I have one question from the earlier photos. I just want to, it looked like you only owned one tie because both photographs, I swear <laughs> that was the same tie. If we go back, you will also notice I only owned one belt. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I was accurate. It was the same tie. You were, you were accurate. That tie still hangs in my closet, but I don't wear it much anymore. <laughs> I've added Adam, a few more to the collection. This is Kristen Lewis. I was curious if you could go back and just clarify what euchromatic means. I, I didn't quite get that. Yeah, absolutely. And now, you know, you're really reaching outside of my comfort zone because this is all stuff I picked up on the job over the past 20 years and talking with biologists rather than being officially taught this. But in my mind, the differentiation is kind of twofold. Um, first, it's an epigenetic definition. And so it's not really based on the sequence, it's based on what the chromatin is doing. And so if the chromatin is kind of densely packed and not expressing genes, that generally means heterochromatic. The genes and the kind of actively expressing regions and the accessible regions of the chromatin is the euchromatic fraction. And I think it goes all the way back to early days of looking at cells under the microscope and staining the chromatin, and they would stain differently depending on how densely or, or undensely they were packed. And so uh, most all of the genes that people care about in a clinical setting live in the euchromatic fraction, which is the stuff that was finished by the genome project, with a few exceptions uh, that we can talk about later that live in these red regions, um, that there are some regions buried within that heterochromatin that are expressing genes and doing interesting things. I, I think that's right, Adam. It's interesting. I, I believe, you know, for a long time, after the invention of the microscope, we actually started to be able to visualize chromosomes through cytogenic. There was always this observation that with certain stains, certain parts of the genome looked a little different and nobody ever really understood. Yeah, they, they couldn't predict then that it was gonna be stuff that parts of the genome that had incredible density of repeats. So it is interesting to observe the arc of first visual observation and then eventually when we went to sequencing, figuring out why it was that they stained differently because they were the composition of that DNA was just very different than the generic you know, DNA that existed throughout most of the rest of the genome. Yeah, there's another related and fun story uh, buried in there that some of those tandem repeats that are in the red regions that make up things like the centromeres uh, are referred to as satellite repeats. And the history of why they're called satellite repeats is back when people would do uh, density gradients of DNA through centrifugation, um, you would have different bands and there would be kind of a big fat band, which is all of kind of the genomic DNA. And then there would be these little bands floating off in the sky that they would call the satellites. And the reason that they would float off differently from the rest of the genome is because they are a tandem repeat of the same sequence over and over again, which gives them a uniform density that's different from the random density of DNA. And so they would float off. People didn't know what they were. They called them satellites purely based on a physical observation. And now we know that it's these tandem repeating arrays that make up a lot of the heterochromatin. It's always astonishing what people did before the advent of computers. <laughs> I don't see any other questions. I think you should keep going on your, on your talk, Adam. All right, sounds good. We will certainly generate more questions by the end as we continue to dive into the nitty gritty. So the first question is, what do we do next? You know, it's the early 2000s. Uh, NHGRI has promised this human genome will make big changes in medicine going forward, but we can't spend $5 billion <laughs> on every genome that we want to do from here on out. And so how do we go about sequencing another and another and another human genome and how do we translate it into clinical diagnostics? So I'm gonna draw a distinction here between the reference genome, that's what we just talked about, that was done with huge amount of effort in an international consortium versus a routine genome, which you can literally get done in a clinical setting now for less than $1,000.
the reference genome is kind of a one-time thing and it's an archival product that we put in the databases. And the purpose of that is to have a complete representation of the genome, not just for humans, but we do these reference genomes for all other variety of species. We'll often utilize multiple technologies so that we can make it as complete as possible and we can make the bases as accurate as possible. We strive for as few missing sequences, as few gaps as possible. And current costs for a reference genome are under $10,000, which we'll come back to at the end, which is pretty astonishing considering uh, $5 billion in today's money for the Human Genome Project. You can make a product that's better than that 2004 reference today for less than $10,000, which is pretty incredible and a real testament to the investments in technology and basic science over the past 20 years. To a routine or a clinical or a personal genome sequence, where the uh, purpose here is to identify differences or what we call variants between your genome and a reference genome or a set of reference genomes. Here for cost purposes and for speed, we usually use a single DNA technology. Um, these for reasons you'll see later, always have missing sequences and some amount of errors within them. But the upside is that they can be done very cheaply for just a few hundred dollars in some cases, depending on the technology. So what's the current state of the art for building these reference genome sequences? Well, step one is always acquire a human DNA sample. So let's think about a clinical setting. Maybe somebody has a rare disease and we want to understand the cause underlying that. You start off with a collection of their cells, which you can collect via blood or even just a simple cheek swab as in this animation. Isolating off of that swab, you get a collection of epithelial cells. In each of those are copies of your genome. Break open the cells like before, shred it into little bits. And again, we're back to the process of doing DNA sequencing. So shear DNA fragments as input into a variety of DNA sequencing instruments. And as you heard in prior seminars, there's a wealth of technologies to choose from now, from Illumina to Nanopore to PacBio, et cetera. Each of them have their own strengths and weaknesses and cost considerations, but all of them digitize these DNA molecules into ACGs and Ts as an output. And so we end up with a patient sample. And at the end of the day, we have a file on a computer of ACGs and Ts of many, many millions of individual sequencing reads. And depending on the technology you use, those can vary from as little as 100 bases to as many as 100,000 bases, depending on the technology, but not yet. Maybe if you're watching this on YouTube in the future, we'll have a technology that does a whole chromosome in one go, and that'll put me out of business, but I'll be happily retired by then. So given those sequencing reads, how do we go about finding the differences? So we start with the reference genome. And like I said, this goes all the way back 20 years ago. Um, there's been iterative improvements since, but the foundation is built on that genome reference consortium reference from 2004. And we take each of these individual sequencing reads and we map them or otherwise compare them to the genome one at a time. And so sequencing read one gets compared using very efficient computational algorithms to find its home where it likely originated from in the genome. And then we repeat that process, keeping track of what we find. And so read one matched to that region of the reference genome, we're gonna say, okay, here's what that personal genome sequence is starting to look like based on read one. And then you repeat this process for many millions of reads in some cases. Sequence read two, I promise I won't let this animation go on a million times, but you get the idea. Each of these reads gets sampled from the pool, compared against the reference, and then a personalized genome representation is being constructed on the fly. Now, sequencing read four is a bit of a odd case where we search it against the reference and maybe we don't find a good match. That can happen because of these gaps in the references, or it can happen simply because your genome is too different from the reference genome because we are all unique individuals after all. And so we need a bin of kind of unaligned reads as well as the reads that align properly. And we continue this process over and over again until we can reconstruct a page of your personalized genome. Along the way, encountering maybe some more reads that don't match. 
in the end, you end up with pretty good coverage. I would estimate maybe around 85% to 90% of your personalized diploid genome would be covered or otherwise interrogated by this style of approach as it's run currently. But as we were talking about, the vast majority of the euchromatin and the genes will be successfully targeted by this approach. And as we were talking about with depth of coverage, each bit of your personalized genome sequence is read and localized many times over to ensure accuracy, maybe around 30 times. And that can give us an accuracy of 99.9999 and higher in terms of our confidence that each base of the genome is correct. And that's very important to have that accuracy in a clinical setting because we don't want to chase false positive variants um, that aren't really the underlying cause of a disease. We want to see only the real true differences in that genome. Um, so that we're not wasting time. Given the mapping that's been done between all of those reads and the reference, we then look for the differences between the personal genome sequence and the reference genome sequence. And so it's literally just lining those up on top of each other and annotating the regions where they differ. And so we'll show all of those variants here in yellow and red, yellow being the corresponding position in the reference and red being the variant position in the personal sequence. And those variants can come in a number of flavors. There's single nucleotide variants, sometimes SNVs, SNPs, SNPs you'll be hearing about. Um, and that's a single nucleotide switch from one letter to another. You have deletions where there was a letter in the reference that's deleted in a personal sequence. There's duplications where there's a sequence that's copied multiple times compared to the reference. There's insertions where you have a new sequence inserted in the personal genome that does not exist in the reference genome. And a special type of insertion and deletion are tandem repeat expansions or contractions, which have since been linked to a variety of genetic diseases. Important to measure those variants properly. And a very big variety of what's known as structural variants. And these are large scale duplications, inversions, rearrangements that in this analogy would involve multiple pages of gross structural changes to the genome that we're not gonna show here, but can be very important for understanding genetic disease and phenotype. But then also because the reference genome is incomplete, you have some gaps where the personal genome sequence is missing sequence because either it was missing in the reference or not a good match in the reference. And those reads go unmapped in the trash bin. If you're a really astute bioinformatician, you can dumpster dive in that trash bin to try and understand it, but most of the time those reads go unanalyzed. So that is the basic clinical genotyping approach that's used in the vast majority of labs uh, to this day. Uh, but I wanna talk about some of the limitations of that approach. As we mentioned, the reference genome, you know, as of 2022 uh, has gaps in it, accounting to about maybe 8% of the total genome length. And so all of those corresponding regions in your genome will go unanalyzed by this approach because they simply don't exist in the reference, so there's nothing to compare them to. Second is every genome is different. We're all unique individuals at the genomic level, unless you're twins. And because of that, there's differences in your genome that might not be matching well to the same sequence in the reference. And this problem gets worse the further you are away from the reference. And so that reference, into, um, reference genome represents some collection of individuals. And if you are further away on the humanities family tree from those individuals, this process will work less well for you than if you're closely related to somebody in that reference collection uh, evolutionarily. And that's just because you will have collected more differences if you're further away, and therefore your reads won't map quite as well. And so there's some equity issues here as well when relying on a single reference genome. And then what's most interesting to me is this kind of structural variation within the genome. And it's particularly mediated by genomic repeats. And because they are similar in sequence, they tend to recombine or otherwise shuffle in strange ways, resulting in them being highly variable between individuals. And a very clean and easy example that you should all be familiar with is the idea of RH blood group antigens. And so if you know your blood type, there's a plus or a minus at the end of it. And that plus or the minus simply indicates the presence or absence of this RHD gene, which ends up expressing an antigen that's important for blood typing. 
And shown here in the little colorful arrows are three different genes. Their names are given there. The arrows show the direction of the gene. And there's four different versions of what we call a haplotype here. So if you look in four different individuals, you might see these different arrangements and different copy numbers of the gene. The top one is an RH minus individual who is missing the RHD gene. The second line is the most common haplotype and that's the reference haplotype an RH plus, which has one copy of the RHD gene. But you can see in the third line, there's some color changes where a bit of the tan got swapped with a bit of the green. This is what's called a gene conversion event where a bit of sequence kind of gets copy pasted from one region of the genome to another. Or you can have copy number changes where individuals have multiple copies of the RHD gene. So imagine for a second that you are individual four and you have two copies of the RHD gene and somebody is comparing you to reference line one that has no copies of the RHD gene. Here we're talking about a hugely important gene for clinical phenotype as basic as blood type. And you can't analyze line four against line one because those RHD genes simply don't exist in the reference. There are a ton of genes in the human genome that behave like this, especially immune genes and genes related to adaptation. Um, and to analyze them against a reference is extremely difficult due to these mapping-based limitations. So one thing I want you to take away from this is the idea that these repeats that caused so much trouble at the beginning of the talk and in the Human Genome Project and makes genome assembly a difficult and fun problem, they matter functionally to the genome. And so they weren't excluded originally from the Genome Project because they were uninteresting or not doing things that had functional consequence. Uh, they were excluded because they were hard. And frankly, in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, it wasn't even thought possible to sequence these regions of the genome, despite their significance. Um, just a quick overview of what some of those repeats that have function look like. There's segmental duplications. That's kind of of the style of that RHD duplication. That's where you have a region of the genome that's kind of bulk copied to a different region of the genome and duplicated. And within that duplication uh, is genes. There's what we call ampliconic gene arrays. These are very common on sex chromosomes or the RDNA gene arrays. Uh, these tend to be very functionally important genes that for whatever reason need many copies. Either you need a lot of that RNA or a lot of that protein, or in the case of the sex chromosome, sometimes you need a backup copy so that if one of those copies fails, um, the protein can still be successfully constructed. There's the centromeres, which are these satellite repeats that I mentioned earlier. They're tandems of tandems, very complex repetitive structures, but they're essential for the segregation of chromosomes during cell division. Uh, there's what's called transposable elements or jumping genes that move around in the genome. And depending on where those insert in the genome, they can uh, affect the function of the surrounding genes. And then there's the telomeres, which you've probably heard of, which are the caps of the chromosomes and some of the sequence adjacent to them. And the short arms of the five human acrocentric chromosomes, which has been a focus of my research over the past number of years. And in human, that's chromosomes 13, 14, 15, 21, 22, and Y. They're all a little um, non-symmetric and they have a tiny little arm on one side and a big arm on the other side with the centromere kind of pushed to one side. And the entire sequence of those short arms of those uh, six chromosomes basically was unresolved for the past 20 years um, because it was too difficult to clone, too difficult to sequence and assemble. But I was trained all the way back to elementary school typing in this code that typos and missing pages really matter a lot when it comes down to coding. And so it was really frustrating as a kid transcribing these pages out of a magazine into the computer, because if you missed one character or you missed one line, very likely the program would break and not work. And all of that code was important to understand. Follow on to my experience with the Amerithrax case where the forensics of that investigation came down to a single character difference out of 5 million bases. And the whole case hinged on the discovery of those single character differences between these different morphotypes. I was trained, I realized in making this talk from a very young age to care a lot about perfection, about these codes being you know, base accurate and as correct and as complete as possible. 
And if you go to the Wellcome Institute and pull one of these human genome books off the shelf, this is based on the genome reference from the early 2000s. There are pages and pages in that book that are the letter N for millions and millions of Ns. And N means unknown. And that really just bugged me <laughs> at a very fundamental level that there's pages and pages of the human genome that as recently as 2020 were unknown, summing up to around 200 to 300 million bases of unknown sequence in the human genome. And so how do we fix that problem? I was highly motivated to go back and sequence a complete human genome to fill in those gaps and really was curious what was in those missing pages. And I just wanted to know after all of these years, what was there and what's it doing? Just purely out of curiosity's sake. And I think as Eric said at the outset, it was important for this kind of new generation of genomicists to come in because we didn't have the prior belief that it was too hard or impossible. We kind of naively came in thinking like, oh yeah, this is missing, we should fix that uh, without all of this prior weight of understanding the difficulty of the problem. And sometimes that naivete is helpful because otherwise we might've been scared off. But I had a very basic idea and it's easy for everybody in the room to understand that jigsaw puzzles are easier when you're starting with big pieces. And it really is the same analogy in genome assembly. If you have bigger sequencing reads, it's easier to put them together, especially when you're dealing with highly repetitive regions of the puzzle. And the way to think about it is imagine the edge case. Imagine that we sequence an entire read in one piece and one chromosome is one read. The assembly is trivial. The read is the chromosome. Or if the chromosome is sequenced in two pieces, it's very obvious how to put them back together. And so we just needed to chase technology that would get us longer and longer sequencing reads. And around 2013, 2014, a technology came on the scene called nanopore sequencing, uh, commercialized by Oxford Nanopore Technologies. And it promised, as we later found out, the idea of ultra long read sequencing, where we had a proof of concept paper that showed you could sequence reads over a million bases in length and compare that to reads that are a thousand bases in length at the Human Genome Project. We have a thousand times longer reads now. The genome assembly problem might be achievable. We didn't know at the time how long the reads needed to be, but we knew if we were gonna have a shot, it was gonna be with these reads. And the scale of this technology is pretty awesome. Uh, the earlier chemistries were based on a re-engineering of an E. coli membrane transport protein called CSGG. And here's a picture of it. And it has a little constriction point in the middle that's just wide enough for a single strand of DNA to pass through it. And as you learned, you measure the current changes over time as that DNA transits the pore. And from that, you can use machine learning techniques to take the current change electronically and convert it into ACGs and Ts. The fact that you can thread the needle is amazing. The fact that you can translate those little fluctuations and picoamps of electrical current with machine learning to ACGs and Ts is incredible. And the scale if you imagine that nanopore as the size of my fist, you know, scale it up to eight centimeters, that's like threading three kilometers of rope through my fist in a matter of minutes and reading off the bases as they zip through. Um, hats off to the people going back many decades that conceptualized and realized this technology. So with that technology in hand, um, my great friend and collaborator, Karen Miga, and I launched what we called the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. And we built it as a very grassroots bottom-up effort to build a community of people that wanted to finish the genome, that shared this vision of ours, and that brought the necessary expertise and technology to get the job done. And now the T2T Consortium is over 500 members strong um, towards this goal, singular goal of filling in the gaps of the genome. And as most good ideas, it was a pretty simple idea, uh, but once I explain it to you, it should make a lot of sense. Those ultra long sequencing reads, when you get them off the instrument, they have what we call a long tail distribution. You get a bunch of reads that are pretty small and might not be that much longer than uh, a Sanger sequencing read of a few thousand bases. But if you keep sequencing, every once in a while, one of these whales will come along, as we call it. That's one of these million base pair reads. 
and they kind of just randomly appear at some expected frequency. And so if you think about it probabilistically, there's a very easy way to increase your luck. And it's just to buy a lot more lottery tickets. And so we just put in the time and spent the money to sequence our genome over and over and over again to collect enough of these whales so that we would increase the chances that we would get very long reads in the region of the genome that we cared about. And as we learned at the beginning of the talk, the regions we care about are the repeats and the whales that we care about are the reads that start in unique sequence, pass through the repeat and end in unique sequence because that uniquely tags me to a unique position of the genome and I don't have to worry about that repeat anymore. It doesn't become repetitive if there's a single long read that's spanning it. And so over the course of maybe six months or so, we ran one of these nanopore instruments nonstop to generate enough data to increase our odds that we would get enough depth of coverage of these ultra long reads to help our assembly process. And we came up with some very clever ways and hats off to all of my collaborators and postdocs and graduate students that I've worked with over the years, in particular, Sergey Korin, Sergey Nurk, Nico Rautiainen, Arang Ri, building on the methods that Pavel Pevsner and Gene Myers developed over the years. We began with this genome assembly graph that I explained to you earlier. And here's what that assembly graph looked like around 2019, built from PacBio HiFi data. And if we zoom in on one of those tangly bits of the graph where it's ambiguous, you can see this structure of repeats occurring here, but there's not a clear way to walk each of those nodes and reconstruct the text. You remember from the Dickens analogy, we have to kind of pick an order of the nodes to walk through, and that ordering is gonna spell the text of the genome. But now we have these ultra long reads, we can map them to these individual sequences in the graph. And this is using code that Miko Rautiainen developed called Graph Aligner lines those very long reads up to the graph. And now that spells the path for us. You can see here that that nanopore read in red tells us that we need to go from node one to node two to node three. And then we keep layering reads on and they keep telling us which of the re uh, nodes are adjacent in that graph. And eventually it untangles as we say, and gives you a linear piece of DNA from telomere to telomere representing a bit um, in, well, not a bit, the entirety of, say, human chromosome two in this case. And so we applied this technique um, around 2019, the summer of 2020, and succeeded in getting all of the human chromosomes done uh, from telomere to telomere. And this was just a tremendous feeling, uh, talking to some of the people that worked on this, including Sergey Nurk, just describing, you know, kind of their hands shaking when they figured out how to resolve some of these most complex regions of the genome because they realized the importance of the moment and the importance of the resource that they were constructing. And we were so happy to have and then release this first complete sequence of a human genome with all of the gaps filled in that we call a T to T reconstruction. And it really built on the technology over the past 20 years, both computational and biochemical technology. The Human Genome Project kind of from start to end was a 10 year effort that filled in 92%. But as they say that that last 10% is always the hardest. And it took 20 years of technology development, algorithm development, genome assembly development, et cetera, to finish off this last remaining 8%. And it was really this combination of technologies of PEC bio hi fi and then layering on the Oxford nanopore data in the way that I mentioned that allowed us to get for the first time truly whole genome sequencing without gaps. And this cover uh, of science here is all of the human chromosomes with in red, the gaps, uh, showed filled in with this assembly. So if you compare to um, that release from 2003, which was known as HG35, uh, to this T to T assembly, which we call T to T CHM13, because CHM13 was the name of the cell line that we used for this project, we increased the total number of bases from 2.85 to 3.12 gigabases in the complete genome. We reduced the number of gaps literally to zero. Um, and not only did we reduce the gaps, but we also improved the accuracy of the sequence. And so in the early 2000s, the reference was about one error per 100,000 bases. We estimate that our current reference assemblies such as CHM13 are one error per 10 million bases. And so orders of magnitude uh, improvement, not just in continuity, but in terms of accuracy as well. But the thing that really blows my mind 
is if today I were to repeat this CHM13 assembly using the tools and the methods and the technology that we have now, we could do it for about $5,000 worth of reagent cost compared to $5 billion for the Human Genome Project. That's a million fold reduction in costs over the past 20 years. And that's driven by, like I said, decades of investment in this basic technology uh, development and computational development. And it's really the parallel development of the computational techniques and our computers getting bigger and faster and the methods getting better in parallel with the biochemical DNA sequencing techniques. We really needed both of those. And as you'll see, both of those technologies experienced a million fold improvement over the past two decades. So what have we found so far? Uh, with that T2T -T genome, we've made some really kind of foundational discoveries about how human genomes work and are structured. Uh, the first of which is the actual sequence and position at a base pair level of human centromeres. And so when you look at the microscope and you see the spindles attaching and pulling the chromosomes apart, that was the level of resolution we were at until just a few years ago. We had no idea what sequence the centromere was actually attaching to and operating on functionally. Now we can see that. For machinery in the cell as important as the ribosomes, we can now understand the sequence and structure of the ribosomal DNA gene arrays for the first time and start to probe variation within human ribosomes and understand if that has a functional effect. We've come to better understand the cause of human chromosome abnormalities, such as Robertsonian translocations, where you have a fusion of two of those acrocentric chromosomes head to head. And this can be important to know if you're a Robertsonian carrier, it greatly increases the risk that your children will have Down syndrome. We found an elevated rate of evolution in these duplicated genes. So not only can we see these segmentally duplicated genes, but we can measure the evolutionary rate within them and see that they have an accelerated evolution compared to the rest of the genome. And so they're undergoing different adaptive and evolutionary pressures and are basically letting evolution experiment in a way that it wouldn't be able to in other parts of the genome that are more well conserved. And then we've discovered through those processes thousands of these large scale so-called structural variants in the genome. In the prior reference and the mapping based approaches, we had a very good handle on small variants like single nucleotide variants and indels. Now we can see these large structural variants and we're finding them by the thousands. And so what's next and what really has me excited for my current research plan is to figure out new functional associations, new disease associations with those variants and understanding how those new variants that we're discovering are leading to or otherwise affecting human genetic disease. And we've continued to make rapid progress on the technology front. And so we did that through a consortium effort and about four years of work to get one human genome done. But we've taken all of those lessons learned now and developed computational programs that automate it. And we can take now a personal human. This is an example of the HG002 sample, which is a National Institute of Standards and Technology reference material. It's the genome of a living, breathing human being. We can sequence it with these techniques and get a diploid, complete T to T assembly of that individual shown here. So two copies of each chromosome, one maternally inherited, one paternally inherited. The heat map is showing you the rate of heterozygosity between those two chromosomes. And the little black lines are kind of showing you how they line up to one another. And if you look at these kind of charts long enough, you'll see structural variants between the two haplotypes. And those are differences within your own genome between your maternal and paternal haplotypes that can have functional effects. But a very cool project related to our newfound ability to generate and assemble personalized genomes is we can go out beyond human. And we recently completed a project with Katarina Makova and Evan Eichler to finish complete genome references for all of the ape species. That's gibbon, orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzee, bonobo, and in this case, Homer Simpson. And we lay them out on the family tree. And this allows us now to look across the whole genome of all of the apes and really understand which parts of the genome are uniquely human and study the evolution of those parts over time as you go back in ape evolutionary history. So this is ongoing and really fun work when we're working with the primate genomes. So I just want to emphasize, I've been in this business about 40 years, and a lot can happen in a lifetime 
of research. So imagine you all as young researchers going off into your future careers about what is coming next. Imagine what is enabled by cheap, portable, real-time sequencing. Methods like Nanopore are further reducing their costs. And I often kind of think of sequencing as almost free these days. You know, think as big as you want because there's ways you can get the sequencing data generated. And now you can even do it in a real-time manner, almost literally bedside to a newborn uh, to diagnose a rare disease at the time of birth, and in some cases, even prenatally. And so imagine a future where everybody will have a complete genome, all of the gaps filled in. We will understand the function of that genomic code, and we'll be able to use it to direct healthcare, diagnose disease, and inform future treatments. But genomics is really this kind of marathon. The technology advances super fast, but you also have to have some amount of patience because we just finished this complete genome a few years ago, but it's gonna be decades of discoveries that are coming out of these regions because we just saw them for the first time and doing the basic science takes so much work to really go in and understand functionally what's happening in the genome. And so we have to continue to invest in this kind of foundational science to understand the function of the genome these biological systems, as far as code is concerned, are incredibly complex, evolved systems that when you look at them, they don't make as much sense as a computer program. They're a lot more complex, and it takes time to tease out what each bit of code is doing. But to our advantage, the technology moves surprisingly and astonishingly fast, and we can build upon that. And so I was born in 1980. I grew up with the VIC-20. Uh, I heard about gel-based sequencing in the early days of the Genome Project, where you literally put out radioactive gels and measured off the bases in these ladders uh, with pulse field gels. Uh, at the time of 1980, we had just started with the advent of Sanger sequencing, finished the genome of a five kilobase virus using these early techniques, and assembling with computers that were on the order of power of a VIC-20 which at the time had five kilobytes of RAM. Look in parallel to the advance over the past 40 years. In my lifetime, it's a million fold advance. We've gone from five kilobase viral genomes to now six gigabase human genomes. We've gone from radioactive gel reads to reads with a protein nanopore read out by machine learning and electronics. And we've gone from five kilobase RAM computers to a phone in my pocket that has a million fold more memory than the VIC-20 that I started coding on with 40 years ago. So it's been a tremendous career because I've been living in this exponential growth phase for both computer science and genomics, and it's been incredibly rewarding and fun to do so. So just to acknowledge and celebrate all of the people that contributed to this work, there are too many to call out by name, but here's a photo of us in Santa Cruz, California, celebrating the completion of the TDT project in 2022. And we just wrapped up a meeting earlier this month, again in Santa Cruz in 2024, celebrating the completion of the human Y chromosome, completion of the great ape genomes and a bunch of other achievements from the project. And of course, building upon the great work of Eric Green, Francis Collins, Eric Lander, Evan Eichler, all of the people that I've had the pleasure of building on and working with over the years that were really pioneers of the Human Genome Project in the early day and laid this essential foundation for us to come through and finish off the gaps. And so that's the end of my talk, uh, and I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. Adam, that was a tour de force. That was fantastic. Can Thank you. Do you, you happen to see the chat? Because we have somebody- I put can. Yeah, I can bring it up if you give me a second. Yeah, and then you could just read read a two part question. From yep, I'm going to uh, go to the two part question we're looking at from Reagan. Yeah, given that the reference genome was constructed primarily from a limited number of individuals, predominantly from one individual, I have two questions. How do you distinguish between true mutations and individual specific SNPs within the reference genome? And furthermore, how might these affect the mapping? of other genomes to this reference? Excellent question, Reagan. I can tell you know what you're talking about and do your homework because these are very informed questions. And we are addressing these problems with various projects, some of which you'll hear about in future lectures. Stay tuned in particular for Karen Miga, who I shouted out earlier, 
who launched the T2T project with me and is now heading up the human pan genome project, which is replicating the human reference for now many thousands, hopefully, of human genomes that will help address this kind of diversity issue in the reference. But it's a very good question about when you see a difference between a personal genome and the reference, how do you know, is that private to the individual? Is it an error? Is it private to the reference, et cetera? One of the projects that was very helpful for this is the Thousand Genomes Project, which happened you know, in the mid to late 2010s. A lot of the analysis happened in the early, I'm sorry, the mid to late 2000s, and a lot of the analysis happening in the early 2010s. And this sequenced using short reads at pretty low coverage, around 4,000 or more human individuals from around the world. And we took all of those genomes, and I'm using a royal we here because I wasn't directly involved in this project, but as a genomics field, took all of those genomes, mapped them to that singular reference genome, and looked at all of the variants that we could find with the mapping-based approach. And then you can do things like collect allele frequencies or allele counts. For this variant, how many times did I see it in the population and who did I see it in versus the reference? If you see a variant that only exists in the reference and doesn't exist in those 4,000 individuals that you sequenced, it's very likely an error in the reference or it's very likely what's called a private mutation in the individuals that make up the reference. And so that kind of population-based data is really what the focus of the 2000s shifted to after the initial human project was done, shifting to population-based data and generating this diversity information of these variants, how frequently do they exist in the population and in what population do they exist in? It's not perfect because all of that data was generated with mapping-based approaches. And so it wasn't addressing variation of the large structural variety or in the bits of the reference that are missing. And this is the focus of the Human Pan Genome Project, which is trying to do de novo assemblies of diploid human haplotypes in the way that I just described, again, maybe for thousands of human individuals that will give us a similar view of human diversity, but at a structural and a complete genome level. So hopefully Adam, that do you want to say something about part. Nomad? Because they may come across Nomad and maybe it contextualizes it. Yeah, absolutely. So Nomad is this fantastic aggregation database where folks at the Broad, um, MacArthur and others have pulled together a bunch of data sets that were done and sometimes were access restricted data sets where people were sequencing exome data sets, whole genome data sets from the patient, from the clinic, from thousand genomes and aggregating all of that information of variants into a single place. And they make that browsable. So you can go to a position on the human reference genome, look up a position and say, okay, I see a variant in my patient at this position. How common is this variant in the population? And generally an easy way to use that information is if you're looking at a patient and they have a bunch of common variants, it's unlikely that it's the source of say a rare disease because if it's commonly circulating in the population and all of those people are presumably healthy, it's probably not the cause. So it really helps you find the needle in the haystack when you're sorting through thousands and thousands of variants to focus on the ones in your patient that have a very rare allele frequency and are likely uh, predicted to have a functional effect because they frame shift a gene or they truncate a protein or something that would have what we would predict to be a pretty serious effect. And so these types of databases like Nomad building on allele frequency information can be hugely helpful for analyzing uh, this personalized genomic data in a clinical setting. And then there was a second part to Reagan's question. Yeah, how was it determined which section of the genome would be sourced from which individual? Uh, this is really an Eric question because I don't know the history of this, but I think it was largely practical because uh, in the Human Genome Project, as I mentioned, you had to do this back by based cloning process. And why that is manually um, intensive is because you have to take bits of DNA from the human genome, clone them into a, a vector that's then grown up and amplified in E. coli or yeast. Then you pull those clones out, you sequence the individual clones. And for a number of reasons, that cloning process can go good or bad. Some of the samples cloned better than others. Some of the clone libraries would die. Um, some of the clones were specific to a particular institute, so they had ability to sequence them and others didn't. And I think largely for practical reasons, it ended up with ones that worked, made it into the genome. And some worked a lot better than others. And I think that's how eventually we ended up with 80% or so being from a single individual, which was the RP11 back library. Uh, Is that roughly right, Eric? It's about roughly right. So about 70%, I think. But 
But the, the other thing about it is even if it's from the same individual, one stretch of say 200,000 uh, nucleotides from one back might have been from the, the paternal allele and the next one over might be from the maternal or from the same individual. And so, so the bottom line is even when you have it from the same individual, it could be from different uh, sources in terms of the two different um, alleles, maternal versus paternal. Yeah, and this has um, a, is a double-edged sword. So at the outset of the project, the idea to have it based on multiple individuals served a couple of purposes. You know, you have diversity kind of built in. The anonymity is a little bit higher. Um, and we have redundancy in that you've got multiple back libraries for multiple individuals. But the result is that the reference genome in 2004 is a mosaic of different haplotypes, which at its face might sound good, but when you're trying to close gaps, it turns into a real problem. Because as Eric just mentioned, even within an individual, you might be talking about two different haplotypes. And in the worst case, you're talking about two different individuals. And imagine you have a gap in the reference. And on the left hand, it's individual A. And on the right hand, it's individual B. And those are two different haplotypes. There may not exist a sequence on all of Earth that fills in that gap because you kind of have two different haplotypes with different histories. And so to fill in those gaps, we really did kind of have to go back to basics and start with a single individual, a single haplotype, where we know all of that's compatible and the genome assembler is not going to be confused by this mosaic nature. And so the Pangenome Project is taking that kind of foundational principle of individual haplotypes as the resource, but then building complete haplotypes for multiple individuals, where within a haplotype it will be consistent, but we can look across different haplotypes for the diversity. Thanks for the great question, Reagan. Additional there's questions. Also, there's a question in the Q&A section of Zoom from an anonymous participant um, saying, how well do individuals with admixed ancestry align with the reference genome? And is the percent misalignment different in individuals with more homology? It's a good question. Um, Specifically because the reference is a mosaic, as I mentioned, and specifically because 70% of the genome comes from an admixed African-American individual based on ancestry analysis, um, it probably doesn't make a huge difference if your individual genome is being aligned to that historical reference genome, because the reference genome is itself admixed in many ways. Um, there is, however, a difference depending on the population. And so there's a huge source of genetic diversity on the African continent. If you have African ancestry and we're aligning to a single reference genome, it's very likely to not align well in some regions of the genome just because it's impossible for one haplotype to represent the wealth of genetic diversity that's on the African continent. And vice versa, if the reference is my brother, I'm gonna map very well to him as opposed to if the reference is somebody on the other side of the world. And so this is really the justification for the pangenome project, where you're selecting a number of individuals from around the world, from a number of different genetic ancestries, and building a reference that captures that haplotypic diversity in the reference. And from that, then you can deal with issues of admixture, because hopefully all of that ancestral sequence is represented in the pangenome database. And, and that, I think Karen Miga will fill this out a little bit more when she explains Absolutely. how pan genomes are going to be used, because it's it's exactly, as Adam said, it's exactly the reason why we have at NHGRI this human genome reference program, is that we need, I mean, one day we will look back and we'll sort of chuckle at the idea that we thought what the Human Genome Project produced as the first reference sequence, which it was incredible at the time, but it's very old-fashioned and it's a, because it's just not an all-purpose tool. We need to have a collection of references that represent humanity, which is what we're developing now. And then we need to use them in a pan-genome-like framework, which we're also developing now, so that anybody of any admixture, of any ancestry blend, will have um, um, an appropriate capability of having their genome be accurately analyzed. Because um, otherwise, if, if, if without that ability, some people, things will be missed. Yeah, and um, I think sometimes it's an underappreciated consequence of projects like the Human Genome Project that the final reference and the output is not the only useful thing. 
perhaps equal, maybe even more important is learning how to do it. <laughs> and the lessons learned in the 10 years of the Human Genome Project were tremendous and had such an impact on the field, economically, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of the silent consequence. We experienced a similar thing with the T2T project that you do one genome first to learn how to do it. And in the process of that, now we learned how to do many more for much cheaper than it was the first time around. And so you got to start somewhere. So these projects started with one, but yes, we're absolutely doing many, many more now to address exactly these biases and deficiencies that you all brought up. Uh, there's another question in the chat. Yeah, Wait, I think I, I just yeah. preemptively answered the iPad okay, uh, you may have. question. Yeah, fair enough. Adam, do you want to make any comments about um, sort of uh, sort of what how you, how do you advise uh, you know college graduates uh, in particular? Who, who have an interest in, in sort of computational genomics or, you know, genomic data science, whatever phraseology you want to use, but also are interested, you know, sort of the, you know, uh, what the right training path is. Do you really need a PhD? Yeah. What, you know, how important is it to have bench experience coupled with computational and so forth? What, what's your general advice you give about people interested in doing the kind of stuff going on in your lab and some of the work you described? Yeah, and I very intentionally kind of pitched this parallel narrative of computers and biotechnology advancing over the past 20, 40 years, um, because they do go hand in hand, and you would not have had one without the other. Um, and I think that genomics is becoming, as it matures, more and more just an inherently hybrid field, interdisciplinary field of the computation and the biochemistry and everything that goes into it. And so to really make impact in genomics these days, uh, I think requires a good understanding of computation. This doesn't mean that you have to be able to program a VIC-20 to play <laughs> oil tycoon. It does mean that you have to be comfortable in running tools and analyzing big data sets. And so in particular, Scripting languages or analysis languages like R, Python, et cetera, are essential for a modern genomicist to analyze data, draw conclusions, run experiments, and so forth. And so being comfortable working on a command line like Linux or even on your Mac laptop's command line and operating in programming and scripting environments like R and Python, taking those base level courses in college um, or you know, self-teaching is also an option, but I really... Uh, like to be taught because sometimes I'll learn things that I didn't know that I needed to learn. Um, the second point of advice is to just really embed yourself with the people that are doing the work. And like I said, I was trained as a computer scientist. My PhD is in computer science. All of the biology that I hand waved through today was learned on the job and working with and talking with brilliant um, biologists, genomicists, biochemists, what have you. Um, and I did that very early on from this internship at the Institute for Genomic Research. And I continued uh, my PhD at Maryland and then working in forensics and now working at NHGRI, where I have actual physician scientists and clinicians down the hall from me that I can talk to and interact with and just soak it up like a sponge. Just learn every day, take it from all angles. Um, and really, I approach my job as a problem. And then I figure out what do I need to know? What do I need to learn to solve this problem? And I really go out and opportunistically learn the minimum amount that I need from the various fields to attack the problem that I'm working on, uh, because it really is kind of such an interdisciplinary field. If you try to set out to just learn it all, you're going to fail. <laughs> and, uh, I really like to take this problem-focused approach of learning what I need to know to solve the problem. And that really kind of stems from my engineering background. Um, also, I'm realizing I had a couple of slides, so the slides will be posted, um, but there's these three recommended papers um, that I came up with uh, that relate to this presentation. The first one is a very nice review paper from a couple of our T2T colleagues, in particular, Glennis Logsdon, who's a satellite DNA expert who just started her lab at the University of Pennsylvania in Philly. Um, this is a couple years old now, maybe four years old, but it's a very nice overview 
of the different long read sequencing technologies that were critical for the T2T effort. Um, the second paper is the T2T Complete Human Genome Paper, which was published in 2022, um, led by myself, Karen Miga, Evan Eichler, and others. And that gives you an overview technically of how we did it. And some of the stuff that I talked about should be familiar. Even some of the slides that I mentioned today are drawn from that paper. And it talks a little bit about what's new and what we found in the process of doing that. And then lastly is a very recent review by two good friends, Hung Lee and Richard Durbin, who are genome assembly and bioinformatics experts. And they published a review process specifically on the problem of complete genome assembly in the so-called T to T era using long reads and using these advanced assembly techniques. If you really want the technical detail on how genome assemblers work, uh, that's found in that review paper. And then lastly, if you wanna see the smiles and laughs and faces of a number of the NHGRI members of the T2T Consortium, we have this YouTube video up, how to sequence a human genome in seven easy steps, starring myself and Shalise Brooks. Shalise is the one that ran that nanopore sequencer for six months straight that I talked about earlier, um, and a bunch of us fooling around in the lab uh, a couple of years ago, giving you the layman's overview of how the T2T project worked fundamentally. So we will wrap there, I guess. And thank you so oh, much. Actually, for there's attending. one more, there's one more question in the Q&A that um, All right. Love uh, it. there's also I'm... a technical question from the same person. Um, I don't know how to get the Q&A. So if somebody could read the Q&A okay, question. I'll, let me read the second question, because then that's the one you'll, that's a technical one. The first one is more programmatic. I, the technical question is, um, in microbial genome assembly, we have noticed that nanopore only reads are not of good enough quality. So we often have to sequence the same genomes on short and long and then do hybrid assembly. Did you have to do that for the human genome? I might have missed that part of talking. If so, you're using some separate tools, not a unicycler to share. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a very observant question. Indeed, we did use hybrid assembly for the T2T project. It included a combination of PacBio HiFi, which gave us good accuracy, Oxford Nanopore, um, and some short Illumina reads thrown in as well to help with the polishing in the end. And so, yes, I'm familiar with Unicycler, and I know Ryan Wick. That's a great tool. And conceptually, it's very similar in spirit to how we're doing human genome assembly now in a tool that we developed called Verco, which is generating these complete diploid human genomes. And it begins by assembling a high quality genome assembly graph with the HiFi data, and then it threads that graph through and untangles it with the nanopore data, uh, very similar in style to Unicycler. Um, I will say, however, that the nanopore data has made tremendous improvements in accuracy over the past 10 years, and it is possible to get a highly accurate genome from nanopore alone, maybe around 99.99% accurate, or QV40 if you're familiar with QV scores. But to get that last few uh, couple of nines in the accuracy or in a clinical setting, it can be important to do a hybrid assembly. Um, and there have been a couple of papers very recently in the clinical diagnostics case showing that when you're talking about single nucleotide variants and kind of forgetting about indels, nanopore is actually more accurate than short read sequencing because it can read those single nucleotide variants very well and you're mapping the long reads very accurately to the reference genome, so you don't suffer from the mapping bias that you get from short reads. So stay tuned. I'm very optimistic that the long read technologies will be equivalent in accuracy uh, to short read in the very near future if they aren't already in the case of HiFi. The other question the same individual asked, um, it says, I know the H3 Africa has done and still doing quite a, quite a lot. Uh, do you have any ideas how resources for genomics, both eukaryote and microbial, can be kept sustainably funded and running in low and middle income countries to do work like this and also to keep ownership of the data. Probably not what, Ad, that's not the world Adam <laughs> travels. Well, I do, th in, but, I do but think I, about the world on exactly, the funding and, side. Uh, exactly, because you're reducing the cost of all these things. Yeah, precisely. Um, we think about it and in the context of the pan genome, we live it politically as well because we're trying to get genomes sourced from all over the world. And we don't wanna walk into countries and pull people off the street. We want people to be doing this themselves and contributing it to a global effort. And so the way that we're currently addressing this is by driving the costs down, as Eric said. And in the case of nanopore and technologies like that that are highly portable 
and have a low barrier to entry, meaning that the instruments are basically free and you just pay for the reagents through a lease agreement. The nanopores can be distributed basically on site in low income countries um, and used to sequence whatever, genomes, et cetera. There's uh, famous examples in the case of the Ebola outbreak years ago, um, Nick Lohman and others deploying nanopores on the African continent, doing sequencing in the field and reporting evolution and spread of outbreaks in real time using nanopore in um, low resourced countries. So we're doing it on the technology side and we will leave it to Eric and others to do it on the funding and political side. All right, I think we will stop it there. Thank you, Adam. And um, thanks for everybody for attending.